but it seems like everybody knows her already, <laughs> but we're going to do this anyhow. So she's here to talk about her new book, Visionary Women. Uh, she's already the author of The All Night Party, The Women of Bohemian Village Village and Harlem, 1913 through 1930. Uh, she contributes to the New York Times Books Review. She's been published in the Smithsonian, South Harper's, Bazaar, and Elle, among other publications. Thank you very much for giving us this talk. This really does feel like old home weight. This is my favorite town. I want to die in Cream Hill Lake. Not right away, but um, um, so usually I speak and then I do a little reading, but I'm going to mix it up a little because we're among friends, and I'm, I, I'm going to also start with a story. I was recently in LA at the LA Book Fair, and it was I was on a panel with um, fellow biographers. And toward the end of the panel, um, the moderator said, okay, tell, tell us some funny stories that didn't make it into the book. So each person um, told a, a number of funny stories, and we really started to kind of up the ante. And my story was um, about Jane Goodall, who's one of the women in my book. And Jane Goodall tells the story of, um, she was in LA, and someone uh, said, okay, you've got to, you've got to um, come and speak before a group of, um, policeman, LA policeman, and we're doing it in an hour. And she had no time to prepare, and she thought, policemen are never gonna be interested. So she walked into the room, and there were all these cops sitting, kind of looking down at their laps, that, you know, not happy to be there, clearly had been ordered there. And she thought, and she was really scared, and she thought, what am I gonna do to capture their, their, uh, their attention? So she said, you know, if I was a, a chimpan female chimpanzee and I walked into a group of um, dominant male chimpanzees, I would do the wise thing, which would be to um, display my genitals. <laughs> <laughs> At which point, she had everyone. <laughs> so, I'm not going to display my genitals. <laughs> um, actually, okay, I wanted a, a little more. So, one of the things I, uh, um, this is a book about four women, um, Rachel Carson, who um, in, at age 55 in 1962 wrote Silent Spring, as most people here will know, um, kicking off the environmental movement. Jane Jacobs, who a year before in 1961, uh, saved Greenwich Village from the wrecking ball saved Greenwich Village from a highway through Washington Park and wrote um, an audacious little book called The Life and Death of Great American Cities, which completely changed the way we think about cities. Jane Goodall, who we know um, in 1960, at age 26, discovered chimps um, using tools, which changed the way we think about animals, and Alice Waters, who um, in 1965, on a junior year abroad in France, fell in love with France and food, and came back and started Chez Panisse, changing the way we think about food and eating. But um, I think before I tell you why I've um, written a book about four women who didn't know each other and were in different fields and were in different generations, I will, I'm just gonna read you a little just to set the scene. Um, I'm someone who never can remember anything unless it's attached to a story. So I've written the book, um, so that the ideas are really attached to stories, because that's the way I learn. So I'm going to just read the, the opening, just to get us going, and then I'll, I'll talk. OK, so this is 1962, and it's Maine. It was midnight when the lone, auburn-haired woman arrived on the beach. Tall and stooped, just shy of 55, Rachel Carson looked considerably older than her years. She swayed a moment as she sat, drank in the briny air. To feel the full wildness, she switched off her flashlight. Then, adjusting her eyes to the darkness, she turned her attention to the swell and roar of the sea. Tonight it was full of diamonds and emeralds, flecks of phosphorescent that wave after wave hurled onto the sand. The individual sparks were huge. She could see them glowing in the sand were sometimes caught in the in-and-out play of water, sleuthing back and forth. This is what Carson lived for, bearing witness to the natural world in all its mystery, 
attuning herself to the earth's rhythms and eternal cycles, feeling a part of the vast stream of time, was why she'd spent the last five difficult years pushing so hard to complete Silent Spring. For all her travail, she'd known from the moment she'd first read the field studies on the dangers of the pesticide DDT that she would feel no future peace until she shared with the world the gravity of what she saw. She'd written the book because she wanted to change things, to alter the way people treated the natural world, to stop the mindless poisoning of it. Though Carson knew she had little time left to live, sitting on this beach tonight, she had no regrets. She was filled with a sense that it had all been worth it. The years of isolation, the painstaking work, even her battle now lost against the cancer. The public's rece reception of the excerpts appearing all summer in the New York had been immediate and enthusiastic greater even than she dared dream. Especially cheering had been E.B. White's kind note, commending her for, by now she memorized the words, the courage you showed in putting on the gloves and going on with this formidable opponent and for your skill and thoroughness. Silent Spring would be an Uncle Tom's cabin of the book he predicted, the sort that will help turn the tide. Perhaps she could relax now. People were finally beginning to ask questions. They no longer assumed that someone was looking after things, that the aerial spraying of DDT must be all right or it wouldn't be done. They were beginning to understand that once these pesticides entered the biosphere, they carried the same hazards as nuclear fallout, the same capacity to alter our genetic makeup in grave and irreversible ways. These chemicals not only killed bugs, but also migrated up the food chain to poison birds and fish and eventually sicken humans. Carson hadn't been surprised by the smear campaign the chemical industry was mounting that summer. She'd anticipated their aggressive attacks on the book, but the defamation of her character, the charges that she was a communist and a subversive, that her purpose in urging more care in the use of agricultural chemicals was to jeopardize the food supply. This she hadn't expected. The most vulgar had come from the former Secretary of Agriculture, who had wondered aloud why a spinster with no children was so concerned about genetics. <laughs> okay, so that is the opening of, of Rachel. Now, we skip forward to um, the same introduction. That same summer of 1962, several hundred miles south of where Carson sat, an impish white-haired woman in a dark shift and a necklace of oversized beads stood holding a placard on a street corner in Lower Manhattan. Tall and sturdy-faced, oh, sorry, Tall and square-faced, with a Dutch boy haircut and thick black-rimmed glasses perched atop an aquiline nose, she searched the crowd, smiled in recognition as she spotted her neighbor, the owner of the coffee bar down her block, which lately had become a community clubhouse, the place where she and others from Greenwich Village, Little Italy, had been strategizing over martinis and cigarettes for weeks. Tonight, he was dressed as a skeleton and carried a placard shaped like a tombstone on which was scrawled, Death of the Neighborhood. She shot him a quick, amused look, nodded in appreciation at his getup, then leaned in to confer for a moment with the congressman standing to her left, knitting her brow in concentration. She glanced at her watch and shook her head in agreement, sending her thatch of white hair flying. Then, moving with obvious deliberation, she threaded her way through the crowd toward the podium, her quizzical face set despite the pattern of applause that swelled through the throng. The object of this applause was Jane Jacobs, a magnetic 47-year-old writer and mother who had recently become a celebrity and pariah to every urban planner in the land. Okay, so that's Jane. We have a little milk, I mean, not milk. A <laughs> <laughs> wine, maybe. <laughs> okay, so back to the question of why I've written about four women who didn't know each other and were in different fields. It turns out that these four women had a huge amount of common. And what I was really looking for as I was writing the book was the kind of connective tissue that not only joined them, but sort of reflected the era. All four of them were uncredentialed outsiders. Two of them weren't even college educated. Jane Goodall and Jane Jacobs had been to college. All were green thinkers before green had entered our collective vocabulary. None were Ivy Tower theorists, but rather people who waded into their fields, in their respective fields, and got their hands literally and figuratively dirty. 
all spoke truth to power at a time when no one was speaking truth to power because it was the, 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 the shadow, people were living in the shadow of the McCarthy years, and certainly women didn't speak truth to power. And against all odds, all prevailed. Um, and most interesting, maybe, is all had their breakthrough moments in the beginning of the 60s, just as the culture was changing, just as the second wave of feminism was breaking, even though they didn't identify as feminists. And sort of it was a moment in the culture where there was, so, there was enough of a shift and a kind of opening for new voices. So because it was the beginning of the 60s, 60s I assumed that my fifth character was going to be the 1960s, which it turned out that is a character, important. But the more I read and researched, the more I realized it was really the 50s that was my fifth character. Mm -hmm. Because it was the 50s that all four of these women were the values of the 50s and the priorities of the 50s that they were pushing back against and really speaking out against. The culture's love affair with science-based technology, the, the, the culture's um, willingness to plunder the commons, the increasing disconnection from nature, um, the deference to big business, um, and so let's talk a little about the 50s. We've all lived through them. Many of us had duck and cover exercises in school, um, as did I, um, which, by the way, is a really interesting, you know, when, um, well, I'll, I'll, I'll go back and forth. The 50s was an era of Cold War fears and conformity. As I said, um, people were very much afraid to speak up because of the McCarthy years. The, it, was a, it was a decade driven by strains of hyper-masculinity, the poster boys with the Marlboro men and the Don Drapers of the world, the, the advents, corporate titans and the um, um, you know, clever ad man. Um, the great legislative moment of the era, um, or the great achievement was the, inter, uh, was the highway system. And its justification, because it was hugely expensive, was to be able to whiz the new um, class of, of gray-suited businessmen from newly minted suburbs to the cities and, more gravely, to move arms and materials and nuclear uh, warheads uh, through, uh, all through the country should nuclear war break out. It was a completely schizophrenic era in that people were terrified of nuclear Armageddon. There were nuclear tests going on all through the 50s, but they were also um, kind of in, uh, it, woozy with the prosperity of the country. Um, technology had, had ushered in um, huge economic well-being. Um, William Levitt had taken Ford's idea of, of mass production and applied it to houses, so suddenly houses were being mass produced. McDonald's had um, followed suit and, and there was suddenly mechanized food, assembly line food, and which came out on a conveyor belt, and more people could eat for less. Um, there was the sense that our technological know-how would solve every problem. Um, all of which is to say that um, bugs would be eliminated with chemical pesticides. Oh, I, I should say that the bomb had won the war, and so chemists and physicists were king. And um, it was during the war that DDT and other um, really toxic chemicals were developed. And they were incredibly useful. They, they killed lice for, for soldiers in the trenches. They wiped out um, insects that were di disease-bearing insects that carried typhus. And so these chemicals were, were part of the war machine. And after the war, um, the chemical companies had a huge surfeit of product, no more war, and so they decided they would domest domesticate these chemicals, and thus was born the pesticide industry. Um, so, and this was all considered something very good, as you know, it's, it's easy to forget. I, I tell that my, I think my mother and father never met a bug spray they didn't love. <laughs> and I think a lot of people were that way. I mean, there were, there were spray campaigns over the entire northeast of DDT to wipe out mosquitoes, and there was the sense that, you know, this was a good thing. Um, animals would be artificially fattened with pharmaceuticals, um, speeding up production, making things more efficient. Farmland would be fertilized with synthetic pest, uh, uh, fertilizers. Um, again, you know, speeding up productivity. Cities would be re-engineered to accommodate the car and the highway. Um, and this was, this was the wave of the future. It went without saying that women, that, you know, men were the breadwinners in this 
in this you know, brawny new world. Women were supposed to stay at home, which is really odd because in the 20s, um, there were flappers and there was a, the first um, wave of feminism. In the 40s, we had Rosie the Riveter and women were in heavy industry and had a, a lot of power. And then suddenly in the 50s, women were told to go home and shop for, for washing machines and that getting their husband's um, shirt collar white was a peak experience. So it's a bad time for women. Um, and that, in terms of my research, one of the things that was, I found just utterly shocking was how few rights women had. Um, only 6% of women in 1962 were doctors. Only 3% were lawyers, and for good reason, very few medical schools or law schools would let in women. And there were very strict quotas. Um, if a woman wanted a credit card, she had to have a male co-signer. If she owned property before she married, as soon as she married, it was her husband's to do with as he pleased. Um, the rent, if it was rented, it was his, his to um, rent. If um, in Pennsylvania, and this is until 1982, there were laws that said a man couldn't beat his wife after 10 on Sunday. <laughs> the idea being, I guess, before 10 it was fine. Um, a woman couldn't be on jury duty in many states because she would be neglecting her domestic duties. Um, a woman, if she was in the newsroom, she could be journalist, but she usually was shunted off to the women's pages where she could write about weddings and funerals, but rarely hard news. If she was a scientist, like Rachel Carson was, she could um, teach, and she could teach maybe at a college, but she was never sent out into the field. She could do what Rachel Carson did, which was edit male scientists' work. And in fact, the reason Rachel Carson knew about DDT is she was working for the Fish and Wildlife Service, and a report came across her desk to edit, and it was, it was early tests of DDT, which were shocking. Um, and so, you know, she was in really early eyes on the whole problem. Um, so we get to the question, how is it that these four women, um, all of them outsiders, all of them uncredentialed, had an ear in 1962 when women had no voices and when the culture was so masculine? Um, the answer really is, had little to do with the 60s and that it was a very receptive time to new ideas, our fresh generation had come of age. But also, these women's orientation, because they were outsiders, because they hadn't been schooled in their fields, they, um, they arrived with fresh eyes, and they were, all of them were highly observant. Um, they went into their respective fields, and they looked carefully, and they, they, you know, because they didn't know better, they trusted their intuition, they trusted their senses, they were very much grounded in the physical world. And, um, they, um, you know, they weren't, they weren't, they weren't, I guess they weren't afraid of the physical, they weren't afraid of their eyes, their, um, their, their senses. Um, a good, a, a, you know, the culture at that moment was, was really in the thrall of theory and expertise. And, um, for instance, get a little more water. It's hard to keep talking. <laughs> Um, architecture was highly theoretical at that point. Um, the modernist canon held sway, and um, the, um, the idea was that cities in particular were in crisis, and the only way to solve the problem was to knock down huge sections of cities, whole cloth, and then to replace them with high-rise housing towers, often with um, empty uh, sort of open plazas or grass around the, the high rises um, and sometimes with highways looping and, and connecting the parts. To this end, um, planners like Robert Moses and Ed Bacon in Philadelphia had been knocking down large sections of old, the older sections of cities and, and erecting these super blocks of towers, all matching. Jane Jacobs at the time was um, working at an arch architectural forum, a job she talked her way into. She hadn't been to architecture school. She knew nothing about planning. She had a huge curiosity, and she was sent to Philadelphia to report on one of these first demolition projects, reconstruction projects. And she, she actually liked modernist buildings. She didn't have any particular prejudice, and she didn't know much about urban renewal. 
But she got to Philadelphia, she took the train, and she was met by Ed Bacon, and he walked her through one of the old neighborhoods, and there were people on the streets laughing and talking, popping in and out of stores. And um, then he said, okay, well now we're gonna go to the, you know, to the project um, that I wanted to show you. And they got, they crossed the street, and they went into this project, and there were these monolithic housing towers, and there wasn't a person in sight. It was completely empty, and she kind of stared. She just, they just left this really busy street. And she thought, you know, there's something wrong here. The human quotient has just been leached out of it. And she said to him, where are the people? And he said, oh, you know, talked about view carters. They don't really understand the symmetry. And, and um, this is all really important to make things very neat. And she thought, there's something here not working. So she went back to Architectural Forum and wrote a very um, daring uh, piece saying these projects are not successful, doing the very opposite of what we want to do. They're not saving the cities. They're, they're killing the life of the cities. And it was very controversial. Um, and, and all our editors thought it was controversial. But there was a lot of, of, of feedback, a huge amount of letters saying, yes, yes, we feel that too. So began for her a real journey of exploration. She decided she wanted to figure out what made cities work. So she started walking every neighborhood of New York City, every block, trying to figure out what made some blocks feel you know, comforting and, and, and welcoming, and why others breathed menace, what made a park work, why some were, were kind of scabby with disuse and, and um, ill-treated and others were, were bustling. She went to new, newly built civic centers, uh, often that had been, um, were, were very much isolated. She called them Project Prairies. And, and she talked to people, she asked questions, and one day, she had a kind of an epiphany. She was in Harlem, and she was on a busy older street, and there were a lot of people um, gathered around three um, TV sets that had hot wired um, from a store. And there was a whole gathering of kids and people, and everyone was chatting and drinking beer. And she realized this, it's the, that cities, in a way, were very much like ecosystems. They had a human ecosystem, and that it was the street life that made a city tick. And that um, that if you wiped out a whole section of a uh, of a city, you killed the connective tissue, the street life, and um, and that allowed sort of one neighborhood to flow into the next, and that gave it its life and share. And she realized it wasn't just the way the buildings looked, but how they functioned for its inhabitants. Um, and she she said she realized cities are like oyster beds, you know they. Um, oysters in, 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 their, in their environment, that, but the people are the oysters, and that this was a revelation. So what's interesting about that is this is 1961. Rachel Carson at the very same time was writing this about the environment and as she was working in Silent Spring. And the, the example I use for Rachel Carson is if you take, and this is really Alan Watts' um, metaphor, if you take a, a drop of pond water um, filled with paramecium, which is a single-celled organism. If the pond water dries, where are the paramecium? There's just a few specks of dust. They don't even exist. And what she was saying was, the only way to understand the paramecium is to understand its, its connectedness to the pond water, to, the, to its environment. And that pesticides were the same way. You couldn't add pesticide to water one place and then expect it wouldn't flow into other places. That nature was not in its little separate compartments that all was interconnected. Um, so both of these women were seeing the world um, in terms of the connectivity of, the interconnectivity of, of living things and their environment, which is a very, very new idea because the, the ethos at that moment was that we could manipulate nature. The only way to study things was, you know, one by one. Um, zoology at that moment was very much theoretical, just as was architecture. And it pretty much involved counting and categorizing species, a lot of times shooting at uh, live animals and then measuring teeth and the length of, of bones. And there was the idea that animals were sort of biological monoliths and that they operated by fixed rules, um, much like a clock. Um, so, so, will, so enters Jane Goodall, um, who um, also no training in zoology, um, had um, worked as a waitress to get enough money to get to Africa, 
She um, called up Louis Leakey, who was a, a, an esteemed uh, anthropologist, and was working at was the head of the museum and said, I love animals, I want to you know, come and talk to you, and was hired, he was a real skirt chaser, so she was immediately hired as his secretary. So a year went by and he noticed, he brought her on a dig with him, and he noticed that she was extremely observant and very still, and also had a sort of capacity for infinite patience, and he started thinking, he'd been looking for someone to um, go on a, 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 a study of chimpanzees in the wild. And he started to think maybe a woman, and maybe this woman, would be really good because she's so patient and she's so quiet, maybe be less threatening to chimpanzees. So he managed to raise money, which was against all odds. He went to all the um, sort of conventional sources and everyone said, are you kidding? Send a, a woman, no training? Absolutely not. But he went to, he finally found some funding and he sent Jane Goodall to uh, Tanganyika um, to study chimps. Now, she arrived and she had no methodology, and there really hadn't been a study of wild chimps, of, of chimps in the wild, but um, she hadn't even read, you know, the primatologist's you know, handbook um, of how you look at things. But because she was, she'd had pets, and because she was using her intuition, she was just intuitively looking for relationships. She was looking for friendships, um, uh, bonds, maybe families. She was, she was looking in a relational way. It took her weeks and months, and probably all of you know the story. She was just tracking these very elusive creatures. Um, it was very hard to see them for a long, long time, but when she finally got to the point where they would tolerate her presence, she started noticing um, Oh, I should back up to say that there was also the sense that that animals had no intelligence, no it, it sort of sentience. They had no intent. They couldn't plan. They didn't have elaborate emotional lives. And because she didn't know better, she started seeing all kinds of very elaborate. She saw deep friendships. There were two chimps every, who, every time they appeared, they rushed up and hugged each other. She saw nurturing mothers and less nurturing mothers. She saw playfulness among uh, baby chimps. And she started seeing that they had, um, there were friendships, there was, there was mourning, there was revenge. There were all kinds of very complex emotions. And then she discovered um, chimps, some chimps using tools. They say what they were doing is they were, there was a termite mound and they were breaking off pieces of grass into little probes and sticking them down into the mound to pull out the termites, which was effectively a tool. But what she, what she was seeing was the same thing the other women, women were seeing, which was the connectedness of the entire um, group, that there was no way you could understand a chimpanzee by just looking at one. You had to look at how they related to each other, and she began to see it was a very complex society. Um, Alice Waters, discovered these same things um, in her own way. She, she, as I said before, fell in love with food and cooking and uh, in France, and she had recognized that a lot took place over the table. There were a lot of political discussions that this is where community began. And when she came back to Berkeley, she wanted to recreate it. And her first idea was to make a little clubhouse where she and her friends could gather and have wine and talk, and she um, she didn't know anything about business. She didn't know anything about cooking. She taught herself by watching Julia Child on TV, and um, but she had a very good palate. She really you know paid close attention to the way, the way things tasted. She started cooking her way through cookbooks, and finally she found someone who would um, pony up a little money to to invest in the restaurant and a few drug dealers. I should add because that was the only. There, those were the only people in Berkeley at that time who had any capital, certainly no bank <laughs> would, would lend her anything. And so she opened this restaurant, um, Chez, Chez Panisse, and initially what she was trying to do was to have food that tasted what, just like what she remembered of France. It had, you know, initially it had nothing to do with um, organic or locally grown. She just wanted really good food. And she started looking for the ingredients um, that had great taste, and of course they didn't exist. Food agriculture at that point was already beginning to be industrialized. She would go to the supermarket and food, would, you know, produce would look great, but it would have no taste. And so she started um, going to places like Chinatown, where there was uh, people were a little bit more in touch with um, 
with the producers, and, and also people started to show up at Chez Panisse knowing she was looking for food, the produce and things that had great taste, and she began to realize that the vegetables that had the most taste were often the ones that had been raised most carefully and without chemicals. And in fact, when I inter interviewed her, she said, you know, I used to hate those organic food stores in, you know, in, in the 60s. They, they always smelled medicinal. The food was always really, over, you know, dry and the vegetables oversized. And I didn't, I wasn't looking for organic, but what happened was when I started to realize producers started to show up and I realized that the food that really was, the, and people had refined it obviously, that the food that really had great taste was um, raised organically. So then she started to really be very serious about that and to try to cultivate farmers in, in Marin and, and anywhere close by who would grow things she wanted to use. And she realized that, again, the connectivity that in order to have delicious food, you had to have healthy art, uh, agriculture. And in order to have a healthy agriculture, you had to tend to the planet. And so she, like the others, discovered these things by doing, not necessarily by theory, which was, which was sort of the, you know, the way. Um, the other thing that really made these women different, besides the fact that they were extremely observant and they were not, um, they were looking to natural systems rather than imposing theories, is they had a very different timeline. The corporate timeline, as we all know, is, is short term, maximize profit, you know, squeeze out everything you can, and with no sense of whether it's sustainable. And all of these women were looking for what was sustainable in the long term, for what was long lasting and um, would endure. And um, one of the things Jane Jacobs said was, it's not just so much that old buildings are better than new buildings, but that every neighborhood needs a mixture of both because um, the new building of one generation becomes the old building of the next, but that tentative new projects always need low rents. And new buildings, because of the price of construction, have very high rents. So the only thing you can have is a box store, bank, something very generic and something that is um, mass produced. In order to have the butcher, the local butcher, and the cheesemonger, and the, and the bakery, you need some old buildings that have lower rents. So, um, so it's really important that, that there's always diversity, which, of course, Rachel Carson was saying about the environment. Um, monocultures don't work. We need diversity. So, okay, different timeline. And, and finally, these women were all great communicators. Um, Rachel Carson's book was an immediate bestseller. Jacob's book was also beloved. And Jane Goodall's book came out um, a few years later, but in 1963, her first National Geographic um, article came out, and it was wildly successful. She was soon speaking before you know audiences of 3,000. They were all great communicators, and they were all unafraid of showing their passions, of writing in the first person, of including anecdotes, of making it personal. And they were, they sort of said, if you can understand this thing, and they were putting very per, a very personal face on big complex questions. And they were saying, this, the science you can understand, and you can do something about it. And this was something new, because the, the culture really had, was different toward experts. Okay, so, I'm going to read a tiny bit, and then we can have questions. But I just want to close with um, a really great quote of um, Wendell Berry, the poet farmer Wendell Berry. And he said, we're a culture divided between nurture and exploitation. And I'm just going to read so I make sure I get it right. The standard of the, of the exploiter is efficiency, and the standard of nurture is care. The standard of um, ex the exploiter is money, profit, um, for nurture, it's health of the land, of the family, of the community, of the place. The exploiter thinks in terms of numbers, quantities, profit, hard facts, and the nurturer thinks in terms of quality, character, kind. And these women, what distinguishes them is they were nurturers and they were unafraid to be that. They were unafraid to say, we need to look at the planet, we need to understand the systems, we need to we need to mimic them and harmonize with them rather than to try to manipulate them because there was so much counterfeiting of nature. So, all right, let me just read a um, tiny bit of Jane Jacobs, I mean Jane Goodall, so you get a little sense. And, um, and, a, and just, I'm just going to read you a paragraph and then we can talk. 
So this is, Jane has just gotten to um, Tanganyika. It was February, the depths of the rainy season. The grass at its highest was more than 12 feet in places. That morning, as always, she'd risen well before dawn, setting out to the dim, canopied forest as the sun was rising. She followed the animal trails cutting through the underbrush. Sometimes she moved on all fours, crawling on bare knees through the dense scrub. Other times she slithered along on her stomach, her eyes scanning the ground for snakes, relieved when the path opened up again. She paused periodically to listen for chimps, faint, faraway cries somewhere deeper in the forest. She watched for dark shapes, a commotion in the leafy canopy, a hairy arm flung out in the course of feeding. She readjusted her direction according to what she heard and what she sensed. Quietly, painstakingly, she ascended this deeply forested slope, her body like a fine-tuned antenna, until she reached the top, her perch these days. There, she settled in for a time, a pencil, her binoculars, and a work cloth notebook slung across her lap. It was almost a year to the day since her first arrival here. It does seem a long time ago in many ways, she wrote to her family. Yet sometimes I can look at the peaks and valleys and see them with my early eyes. The good old early eyes, the peaks and valleys that seemed alien and unforgiving, a nearly insurmountable challenge, made all the more so by the extreme weather. Sometimes the forest was like a high-powered tropical greenhouse, she wrote. The heat and humidity infernal, the winds fierce and wildly mercurial. There were slashing storms, biblical rains with thunder that shook the forest floor, lightning fissures that hissed and fractured the dome of the sky, howling morning gales that froze her bones. Okay, so and now I'm going to give you just a little peek at Alice. Which, <laughs> Okay, so Alice is now a student. She's just gone on Icelandic Airlines, which every student um, took to go to Europe because it's the cheapest. It was always sort of a party on the, on the plane. They slept through their first day in Paris. Alice's rich aunt had given her the name of a place to stay. It was in the first arrondissement, right behind the Place Vendôme, a hotel that was much more expensive than they could afford. But it was dark when their flight landed in Luxembourg and they were tired. The bus to Paris had taken another five hours. It seemed too late to look for something else. Alice had never been to Paris, never been anywhere in Europe. All she and Sarah could think about was sleep. They closed the curtains, great heavy blue curtains, Alice remembered, and fell into bed. When they woke up, they discovered they'd missed the entire next day, <laughs> slept right through it, which was especially painful given how expensive the hotel was. <laughs> To get their bearings, they went down to the dining room and ordered lunch. Alice was shy about her French, intimidated by the waiters. Unsure what to order, they both asked for the soup. It was the cheapest thing on the menu, and they could both pronounce it. Soup de légumes. Mm. <laughs> it wasn't pureed, she remembered. It was just finely chopped up, and it was so delicious, I felt I'd never eaten before. And everything that went with it, those big old thick curtains and a bed that was made with those sheets that had rolled up cushions at the head of the bed, it was a sensibility that wasn't part of my life, had never been. They left and found a cheaper hotel, a seventh floor walk up on the Rue des Ecoles. Wandering the cobbled side streets in those first thrilling days, they eyed every bistro they passed. Initially, they were, on, they were afraid to go in, still self-conscious about their poor French. That was the time when no matter what we said in French, in a restaurant or to anyone else, they said, come on. <laughs> they just refused to understand it. It was understand us. It was so demoralizing and so painful. Come on. <laughs> okay. So, um, you know, I wanted to read you one other funny thing. This is going back, but it's just so unbelievable to me. This is something, this was a book that came out in, it's just in 1963 about how women should behave. <laughs> it was a runaway bestseller by Helen Andelin. It was called Fascinating Womanhood. And um, she counseled that the secret to a happy marriage was to become the perfect follower. A woman should never appear to know more than he does. She should never let her voice convey such qualities as loudness, firmness, efficiency, or boldness. While okay to occasionally share, show anger, she should be sure to sh make sure it was childlike anger, including stomping your feet and scolding your guy in a manner that flattered his masculinity, such as, you big hairy beast. <laughs> so ladies take you know <laughs> Okay. Yes. <laughs>
were any of the four um, women married? Yes, um, I'm glad you asked that. Um, Rachel Carson was never married, and Rachel Carson's story is the saddest in that she uh, supported her entire family her entire life. She supported not only her mother, but her two nieces, and then her niece's children, and um, she uh, and her father for a while. She lived with her mother her entire life, and the great love of her life was a woman who she met um, later in life in Maine, and a, a woman named Dorothy who was married, who became her soulmate and, and, her, and someone she deeply loved. Um, whether it was carnal, we can't say, but yeah, that was the love of her life. And I think that she didn't have the freedom or even the time to have ever married or been um, or had children. She was just, for so long, she was really poor and supporting her family. Jane Jacobs had three children, and I've gotten to know one of her sons, who's wonderful and lives in Toronto. And she was a very hands-off, wonderful mother, sort of assumed that um, they were smart and they would, um, they had a lot of freedom and there was a lot of conversation and she baked cookies and did sort of all the traditional womanly things, but she also always insisted on having a job, which she, um, which, which she said, you know, was very frowned upon in those days. You could have a job if you worked in a daycare center or you were, you know, a stewardess until you married, but once you had children, you were supposed to stop and take care of the children, but she refused to do that and, and she was a great mother. Um, and a great um, activist in, in her neighborhood. She led several fights, including saving Washington Square Park from a highway and saving her uh, neighborhood. So she was, in many ways, uh, kind of a Renaissance woman. Um, Jane Goodall had married, um, after some time in the forest, um, National Geographic, who had been funding her work, decided they wanted a story and they sent a male photographer, a young, handsome male photographer to accompany her and they fell madly in love. And they married um, and they had one child who was raised kind of as a wild child um, <laughs> in Africa. And um, he still lives in Africa, in fact. And um, Alice Waters had one child and married, but she had many, um, being a little bit younger than the others, being part of the counterculture and being in Berkeley, she had many, many lovers before um, she had her husband, and now she's um, single. So um, one of the things about looking for patterns and, and the sort of common ground between these women, and all of them had, I um, began to realize, very, very nurturing and strong mothers, and a few of them had absent fathers. Rachel Carson's father was effectively, he, he never could hold a job, he was really marginalized. Jane Jacobs' father died early, um, she adored him, but he died early. Um, Jane Goodall's father was absent, he, he entered the army during the war and never really returned home. And so her mother came with her um, to Tanganyika in the beginning because the law was that you couldn't let a, a woman by herself without a chaperone um, be out in the world without a chaperone. So her, her mother came and her mother made great friends with the, with the locals in that she'd been told, even though she wasn't trained in, in medicine, she'd been told if she brought Epsom salts and Band-Aids and, and cream that she could make friends. So she set up a little medical tent and um, the local villagers would line up and she'd give them aspirin and, and Band-Aids and she was, you know, <laughs> and so it really paved the way, which was very useful because Initially, when Jane and her mother showed up, the locals thought they were spies and they were going to be counting chimpanzees and they would be um, inflating the numbers because the, it was a preserve and the locals could no longer cut down trees and things in the preserve. And so Jane's mother really um, helped sort of smooth the way and they realized Jane and her mother were not spies. Um, so that was an interesting thing that, they, that they're they, their mothers were so present. Um, and Alice Waters was also, her mother was um, very progressive, her father was wonderful, but he was um, more conservative. And the mothers all kind of said, you can do anything, which at that time was unusual. Yes? And so you've talked a lot in the descriptions of these women and their work about the degree to which what they found kind of was based on a relational way of right. looking at the world. Um, 
Do you go the next step in the book to examine to what degree that seems to be a gender-based trait? You know, I, I think that the, it's acculturation, and I think especially then it was particularly acculturated. I, I don't know whether I would go as far as to say it in an essentialist way to say all women are this way and all men. Men are nurturers, men are perfectly capable of seeing the world in a relational way. But at that time, particularly, the culture, um, you know, said men needed to act in certain ways. And I think that intuitively, women, um, I mean, there was a study, and I've taken a little heat for this, but it's interesting. There was a study done by UCLA that said when men are threatened with fear, they have a fight or flight response. And when women are confronted with fear, their bodies release oxytocin, which is the, the hormone released during childbirth. And that's a hand and befriend. And that may be biological because they couldn't fight. Or maybe, you know, so they had to try to make friends with, with the tiger, whatever it was. Um, <laughs> maybe that's not successful. But, you know, I, I don't know. That's a, that's a, it's an open question. I don't, I don't think that it's exclusive to men and women, but I think that the culture for such a long time has, um, you know, has the only place where women seem to have um, agency was in sort of the relational agency. I mean, as teachers, as social workers, as all those things that reinforce those qualities. So, open question whether anyone thinks about that. Any, yeah. <laughs> um, I find it interesting that these four women lived um, around the same time, and Betty Friedan wrote Good her, question. Um, I, I, I didn't plant her in the audience. Um, <laughs> the, the fifth woman, who's you know, sort of would seem an obvious um, visionary and a sort of uh, breaker down of, of um, cultural mores, is Betty Friedan. Her book. The Feminine Mystique came out in uh, 63, so the year after Carson's. And the reason she's not included, and I thought hard about it, is she wasn't, um, the other four women were looking at the world and looking at systems that were in jeopardy, and they were trying to conserve those systems. They were really green thinkers. Jacobs was trying to conserve older cities and buildings, Carson, the, the, um, the environment, Godall, um, Habitats for Animals and Alice Waters Traditional Farming. Betty Friedan was trying to blow up a system that was profoundly unfair to women. So she was a kind of system wrecker, which we needed. But she didn't really fit in to these women, even though she had a huge impact. So you're, you're right in, in, um, in citing her. Anyone else? Yeah? So you actually met Alice oh. Waters. Yes, I did. But did you, have, did you meet any of the others? I met, um, well, I interviewed Jane Goodall at length. Um, the other, the, the Carson and Jacobson, unfortunately, are dead, so I wasn't able to meet them. I tried with the Ouija board, but. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I had a long conversation with Jane Goodall. Um, with Waters, it was a, a more wonderful interview because it was in person, and I, I it took, um, this is the other thing about the, the, the bi um, biographer's panel, we were all training stories about how hard it is to interview people who are, who are effectively celebrities. It took me a year and a half to set up my interview with Jane Goodall. She's traveling 300 days a year. She's speaking to heads of state. She has huge venues. And it's just very hard to get um, those people to sit down with you. So the best I could do was Skype, which you know wasn't good enough for me, I felt. But we had a very long conversation. Um, and my dog actually was walking back and forth throughout the whole thing. I thought she probably liked that. But with, with Alice Waters, I went in person and I was lucky enough, so Chez Panisse was closed that day, so I was at her house. And so I was, saw her kitchen, which I'll describe. She had um, two wood-burning stoves built into one brick wall, so she, so she could roast lamb and things right inside, but over open fire. It, her, her entire kitchen was dark green with a lot of chopping blocks, but it wasn't modern and it wasn't fancy, and there, there weren't even that many counters. And she evidently loves, she loves collaboration, and she loves to have people over and everyone to cook together. The chairs were mismatched, the table, you know, was a sort of old antique table, um, but it looked like a real working kitchen. Um, she had a very deep um, copper sink, and um, the thing that really struck me when I was there is 
Um, she said, would you like tea? And I said, oh yeah, that would be good. So she, gave, she brought us each a, a, a teapot of our own, and it had a big fistful of fresh mint. So it was mint tea in this beautiful Moroccan teapot, which we each were given. And the tea was the best mint tea you know, I've ever had. And I realized that's her whole modus, is to slow down, taste, you know, take your time, have a conversation. And then, so I loved being able to be there, because maybe if I'd been at Chez Panisse, you know, a waitress or a waiter would have brought us whatever it was, and I wouldn't have gotten that. And also, her, her, her house was very, very spare, and, and there was a sense of that the beauty of the place was really important to her, which is a large part of Chez Panisse, too. She wanted the light to be soft and to have a glow so that people felt warm and comfortable and wanted to hang out. And her house, you know, had just little moments of beauty everywhere, but not a lot of clutter at all. A grand piano in one room that was a library with just pictures and, I mean, just books and pianos. So that was really fun, and I, I really liked her, loved her. Um, and she had such a um, inf kind of infectious enthusiasm that I thought, you know, you'd follow this woman anywhere, which is why she's been so effective, is that she's a great people person. Um, and it doesn't, she, she told me, and it, that she doesn't really come easily. She doesn't, she's more private actually, but she's had to be a public person in order to advance edible education. And, and um, as you read in the book, she now really spends most of her time, not so much at Chez Panisse, but um, on garden projects for schools, helping, helping schools set up garden projects so that kids learn the whole cycle from, from seed to table to back to compost. Yes? I was just thinking directly after the, the Second World War, roughly between the period of 1945 to 55, women who had had traditional roles prior to that time, all the traditional uh, women's roles in the family, during the war period were, the, everything shifted and in some yeah. ways they had to take on the roles that men had. Yeah. And so I think after, during that follow-up period, uh, there was probably some attraction to the idea of returning to order and the, the patterns that they had had. But then during that period, as you mentioned, um, there was something there when these four women, especially, for example, Jane Goodwell Publishing, there must have been a, uh, a huge backlog or surge of almost subconscious need on the part of women yeah. to be allowed to, to get food in. Yeah. No, you're right. You know, and after sort of the fear of the communist menace and, and the McCarthy years, everyone wanted, and, and the war had been so disruptive, everyone did want to sort of go back to home and family and tending one's garden and looking inward and just having a normal life. And so and I think people were happy, women were happy to go back to the household. But, but the other thing that one forgets is books at that moment were subversive because there were there were two networks and they were kind of whitewashed news that everyone got was and and the only place a more dangerous idea or a new idea could be advanced was through books so they were kind of like bombs so you know it's no surprise at that moment those those three women were able to do it with writing and not so much through you know they weren't on radio or anything um, so yeah you're right that that there was a a welling up of need to speak, and, and there were books by men who were pushing back against those same values, but none were um, greeted with as much enthusiasm or as much censure as the women's, maybe because women had never had, had a voice. I mean, Rachel Carson, when her book came out, the chemical companies mounted a major smear campaign against her. Um, they collected money, they, they said, you know, again, that she was a communist, that her, her facts were off, they, it was very concerted, and she was, well, she was dying of cancer, so she had very little to lose, but she believed so deeply in what she was saying that she didn't back down, which, you know, very few of us could have done that. I mean, it was, it was concerted, and, and Jane Jacobs, too, the entire um, architectural profession and sort of people like Moses, ganged up and said, this is nonsense, and you know, there's nothing to this. And so they were inc incredibly courageous, but they also, because their books went out into the world, um, you know, they had a little advantage. And? How what degree do you, are uh, 
Alice Waters and Dan Goodall embracing social media. I'm thinking you're listening to people yeah. like in the Meet Tumor or the Leaky of Stop, you know, like, like all the, yeah. you know, the skirt chases. But I'm also, I'm just wondering how they're available. Well, you know, Alice Waters doesn't do um, email uh -huh. at all. She has. Well, she's obviously not tweeting. In that. She's not <laughs> tweeting. She has, you know, a uh, little band of assistants who do that, who send mm -hmm. those things out. And she's definitely on Twitter, and she definitely, but she doesn't, that um, her, all her assistants said to me, she doesn't really even use a computer. Mm -hmm. um, and she really fought hard against computing, uh, um, put, um, putting Shepanese on the computer, which is necessary for Open Table and things like that. So, I mean, she's embraced it because she has to to advance her program, but that doesn't mm -hmm. at all what she would want to do. Good all, I think, is she's really interested, actually, in social media. Um, She's been, she set up um, something called Roots and Shoots, which is right. again a youth program. And she loves the connectivity. I mean, she told me, we have, a, we have a, you can go on, there's a map, you can go on the computer and you can see every little, what, what, what people are doing all over the world, their Roots and Shoots, um, you know, sections, and she loves it. And she, she was at the, at, at the Paris Climate Talk and she was talking about um, how great it was that you could just, text and tweet and suddenly a, a large group would mass for, for a, a demonstration. So I think she's she's definitely really interested mm -hmm. in it. Which is interesting. Cool. She's the older one. Alice is effectively our age. Um, right. A little older. Jill? Andy, as a writer, was it different writing the two women, Alice Waters and Jane Bell, who you could interview in person or on Skype versus the other two which were Reset research base. Yeah. Well, Alice Waters was hard to write because um, it was because I really liked her and I didn't. She's a, a little bit of an imperfect character. The others, I, I say, the first three are gods and the last is mortal. <laughs> um, I didn't. I mean, I don't like to offend people, so it was very hard to write some of the warts stuff. Um, and also because I talk to different people, I had their voices in it. Um, but I didn't interview, I mean, the other thing we were talking about in this biographer's panel is that it's very dangerous to interview someone too early because you don't know what you want to ask. So I had done a, a whole first draft of the book before my interviews. So what the, you know, Kurt maybe could say it's not the way to do it, but the, there were things I changed and there were things I added, but I already had my thesis laid out and I had s the structure of them. Um, and so the interviews added a kind of warmth. And, and I did, I mean, by interviewing Jacob's son, I got some personal stories. Um, Carson, no, you know, and, and that's probably, um, so it, it was a little different. Yeah, there was a little bit more distance. Um, and, uh, you know, if anything, I probably could have used more distance with Alice Waters <coughs> because I had spent a lot of time with her. I was a little more subjective, and, and I, I tell friends that at the end of the conversation, we started joking and telling stories, and suddenly I thought, oh no, my, my tape recorder is going to be filled with me. You know, it's not, <laughs> not helpful. Um, so, um, yeah, there was a little difference. But I, I was really trying, um, trying hard to... Um, find certain sort of moments, not not an encyclopedic life, but certain moments. And I had I knew what I wanted to block out. I just was able to kind of verify things. I hope that's an answer. I, yeah. Did you start with a thesis or did you start with a fascination with these women and then end up Well it grew out of actually a conversation I had with Kurt, who's here. And it started out with the fact that these four women had, had changed the way we think about the world, a swab of the world, and that there were certain common, um, you know, the fact that they were outsiders, the fact that they were untrained. But what happened was, it kept deepening, and I began to see that their ideas were extremely similar, and that philosophically they were all on the same page. So, yeah, I started out with a sort of rudimentary thesis, and it just kept growing in. The, the trick was not to go down rap rabbit holes and start going, okay, well, I want to write about their mothers, or, you know, um, to sort of stay, you know, focused on. But, yeah, it kept growing. And I think every book does that. It starts to, to be something you didn't know it would be. Um, yes? Of your two living subjects, 
What did they make of the company they were now keeping? <laughs> um, well, you mean the fact that Jane, I mean, Jane Goodall can't be in the forest anymore. Um, do you mean that? But I'm not sure I understand your oh, question. What did, they, what did they think about the other subjects? Oh, were? oh, oh, well, Jane Goodall was absolutely thrilled to be in a book with Rachel Carson, who's one of her heroes. Um, just really, really um, an admirer and very interested in that. Um, we don't know about Jane Jacobs. She, um, her son told me that, that she also was a great admirer of Carson, so she would have liked it. And she would have been interested that with Jane Jacobs, um, the French call her, we, we call her an urbanist. The French call her a philosopher and the Japanese call her an economist. So she was really a thinker. She would have been interested to be intertwined with other women who are in different fields. That would have interested her. I don't know about Alice. Um, she's probably, I mean, she's kind of the lesser of all four. She's probably, I should have asked her that. Um, I didn't. I don't know. But I know that the first three would have been very pleased. Um, Good question. <coughs> Anyone else? Thank you. That was wonderful. Well, thank you.